Thank you, Dr. Chairman. Our last two presenters are with the Air Force. I'd like to present David Strange and Paul Murkowski. And I do want to assure you that there will be lots of time for more questions after their presentations. Uh, we're going to try to make this not too dry, and, we're, and I realize everyone's getting a little antsy, but um, there are a few things we want to tell you about what we're planning, what we've been doing, and what we're planning to do. Um, it's a real quick introduction. My name's Dave Strange. I've worked here at Wordsmith since 2007. Um, uh, I come from a small town in northern Maine outside another base that closed. Uh, I, and um, we've, uh, we've suffered our fair share of hardship there, so I, I think that uh, I bring a significant amount of empathy to the impacts that, that happen uh, based on base closure here. Um, this is the fourth time we've been up here uh, in, in front of uh, more or less this audience. Our goal has been to let you know what our plans are and then report on our progress. Uh, Paul is going to do that. A great deal of you in the room know Paul. Paul came here in 1982, fell in love with the place, worked at Wordsmith his entire career, and I don't think you could, I've been telling people you can't pry him out of here with a crowbar. Um, uh, and he's sort of our right hand man on the program. So Paul's going to kind of walk you through what we've done with PFCs and, and where we're going in the short term. And then we're going to open it up for questions for the, the whole gang. And I know Bob didn't actually sneak off. <laughs> He'll be available too. <laughs> Thanks. So, Paul, I'll hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, as Dave said, my name is Paul Rukowski, and I've lived in this area for about 34 years. Started off uh, working directly for the Air Force uh, 2009. I retired and have been working as a contractor for the Air Force ever since on this environmental, this environmental business. Um, I live in the community. I've, I've lived here for a long time, and I live right down the road from some of the folks that are here uh, that have problems with their wells. Uh, and I'm in the area where Bob's talking about jumping across the creek and sampling. So you can sample my well first if you want. But uh, anyways, uh, I'll go to the uh, first slide. Uh, this is an overview of what I'm going to talk about. The Air Force program objectives, the program to date, uh, 2015 progress, 2016 ongoing plans, uh, future beyond that, the private well survey that we've talked out about a lot already, and the Wordsmith environmental team. Next. Uh, the Air Force is committed to the safety and the well being of all uh, the general public, both on and off their Air Force installations. Uh, they're also committed to uh, identifying all locations on the Air Force Base uh, and around it where there are uh, reasons to suspect releases of PFOS and PFOA. Uh, identify exposures potentially from the, those compounds when they're present above the advisory, the PHA advisory, and then to mitigate those exposures when they're above the PHA. Next. Okay, so here's a, a timeline for the program. 1970 uh, was approximately when the Air Force started using a triple F compound for fighting fires. Uh, as Dale and Bob pointed out, in 2010, they, MDEQ was actually the first ones that came out and did some sampling of groundwater for PFCs. And as a result of that, uh, the MDQ started sampling the fish in the Asabo River and in, in Clark's, Clark's Marsh in 2011. Uh, 2012, as Chris pointed out, the MDHHS uh, immediately issued their advisory on the fish. Uh, in 2012, the Air Force undertook a base-wide they initiated a base-wide screening of all the sites across the property, just kind of taking a snapshot approach at the various wells that were already present. And they sampled those wells, and they also did start a delineation of their fire training area on the base, which we've talked about already, kind of the hottest um, place for PFCs, because that's where most of the AFFF was dis uh, dispensed at. In the spring of 2013, that initial screening was completed. 
2013, a focused feasibility study was done for FTO2, which was the fire training area. And that feasibility study was done to determine what were the best options to go ahead and try and mitigate that uh, potential exposure coming from the fire training area. In 2014, the uh, spring, the Air Force contracted for having uh, a company come in and install that containment system at FTO2. Uh, by April of 2015, uh, around this time, uh, the system was completed and it was uh, began operation. So we've been in operation about 12 full months uh, of operating that system. Um, we also started in 2015 a uh, base-wide uh, pub public assessment, which was to determine, are there any other potential areas across the property where there may have been releases from PFCs? And uh, that was a, uh, started and finished in 2015. And uh, also 2015, we did the residential well survey that we've talked about already of the off-site uh, wells. And then this spring, we're gonna go forward and accomplish the additional wells that weren't caught in the initial sampling due to people not being available at the time. Next. Uh, as I said, the, uh, we completed construction of that uh, system at FTO2 which created a 2,000 foot barrier to the uh, groundwater that was coming from where the fire training ex exercises took place and it cut off the migration of the PFC compounds into the marsh and into the river. And we'll have a slide later which shows you how they did that. Uh, the construction cost was about $2.4 million for that system and the annual operating cost is uh, 400,000. Um, we began operation, like I said, about a year ago and we pumped about 80 million gallons in the first uh, eight months at, the, at that system. And the indications after we started the pumping was that the down gradient uh, wells did show a decline in the concentrations of the PFCs. So put in the barrier, no longer allowed it to, to migrate, and what was left down there was starting to decrease in concentrations. But as Dr. Termath pointed out, it, it's probably gonna be a long-term operation of that system. Um, as I said earlier, the records review identified uh, potential PFC releases, and that has been completed. And as I said earlier, we're uh, the well sampling, of, uh, residential well sampling identified potentially impacted wells, which is the ones we went out and sampled, and we were able to uh, get sample results from about 23, 24 wells. And we've got another 20, approximately 20 to do yet this spring. Okay, this is uh, the system we put in at the fire training area. Uh, this purple here, the dark purple, represents the PFC compounds, the two PFC compounds that we were tracking, which was PFOS and PFOA, and those, that was the hot spot of the plume, which was the darker area. The system went in and installed seven extraction wells along this line. Each one of the, uh, these boxes represented extraction well, which we basically put in a well, to pump the water out, create a barrier, doesn't let the water uh, migrate any further. And then after it's run through two uh, 20,000 pound granular activated carbon systems, like Chuck pointed out earlier, small ones for your own, well these 20,000 pound units are in that uh, treatment system. And uh, it's run through there and then discharged, clean water is discharged right here down beneath where uh, the water is extracted from. And, okay. Oh, uh, no, that's fine. Um, in 2006, our path forward in 2016 is to continue, of course, to operate that pump and treat system, complete the residential well survey this spring, uh, conduct uh, additional site assessments at 15 locations where there were suspected 
PFC releases. Now we do have, from that snapshot I told you about earlier, where we did get an idea of where PFCs were in high concentrations, about five of those 15 areas we already know, at least from one well that it exists in, in those areas. And I'm gonna show you a picture of where those areas are in a minute. And then we're gonna continue the fish tissue monitoring in Clark's Marsh. Next. Okay, these are the areas that uh, uh, came out of our preliminary assessment and that we're gonna do uh, additional sampling at. Um, here's the fire training area right here. So that's where we installed the system. Um, not much needed to be done there because we've got a pretty good characterization of where that's at. But we, for example, we got an area right out here where we had a, a KC-135 crash and about 3,000 gallons of fuel were, was spilled. And of course, what did they do? They poured foam on top of the fuel. Yeah. And so we had, that's a high level of PFC contamination known in that area. Turns out that just last year, we closed out that site from those 3,000 gallons of fuel that went into the ground. It's all gone, all below uh, drinking water criteria, but now these PFCs are still there in high concentrations from long ago, from the same time frame. A um, Couple areas, like here, we spread some sludge out when we closed out the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, what was in the bottom of the lagoons, we removed that stuff, spread it out here in front of the lagoons, closed the system down. Township has since opened that system back up to reuse it. What we found when we did that snapshot of sampling, we found a well in behind here that had PFCs at elevated concentrations. So we're gonna have to go in there and look harder see how, what the concentrations are and you know, where, they're, where they're going from there. Um, let's see. And here's an uh, area that is, is the closest, I guess, to the area where we have the impacted residential wells. Um, that was an old sewage lagoon there. It was the first one that was out here before the this one was created in the early 80s. This one was used prior to that, and they used to, at times, take sludge and from the plant, remove it, and spread it out on the same, in the same vicinity. And um, it is thought that AFFF, the firefighting foam, could have gotten into the wastewater treatment plant through uh, uses at buildings to you know, put out fires or pre prevent fires when there were fuel releases. So it was, it was uh, uh, sludge was spread here, but the, uh, the good news is the information we have in all these areas in this vicinity here, both the base housing and this area of the base, low concentrations of uh, PFCs in, in the groundwater. And as it was pointed out in one of the earlier slides where we had this kind of capture zone here, we're, we're preventing the migration in this direction here and in this direction here with these containment systems and these, these uh, light green shaded areas, they kind of represent the capture zones. Wherever we have high concentrations of the PFCs, we believe that these capture zones are likely catching that PFC from migrating. So anything that's got beyond the base boundary or beyond these capture zones are low concentration. And that's what we've kind of found to date, although we're doing a, uh, this site investigation on these areas to verify that that is true. Um, that's probably the most important. Well, one other large area was the, um, we had a hangar here that was built in right before base closure. Brand new hangar tested the fire training, uh, fire suppression system in the building, dispersed all this foam out of the uh, system into the hangar, doors were open, the foam billowed out and all over the place, got into the groundwater there. So, um, so that was a uh, hot zone and I guess I should point out one more area that is a hot zone. Fire station used to be right here. Uh, that happens to be right in the building, right by Mr. Kellen's 
office where uh, the airport operations building is. Well, where they used to park the fire trucks in there, their routine uh, operations were to, when they went to go clean out the trucks, they went off the edge of the apron and it's kind of right in here, clean out the fire trucks. We find that PFC is in high concentration right in that area there. And that could be the reason. It's kind of right on the edge of the capture zone there, as you can see. And uh, I think the MDQ had a map showing there is some migration in this direction. The good news is there's no residences uh, in this area that are on, on wells that, we, that I'm aware of. There's a few to the south of there, but not where we believe it's beyond the capture zone. But we're going to definitively be able to tell that when we get done with our, our sample. Well, before you go on, um, uh, uh, just a little quick sense of when we talk about these are highs, high numbers versus the low numbers. Um, uh, and uh, if you recall Chris's discussion of parts per trillion, uh, some of the, those two sites, the, in particular the, the uh, hangar and the, where we watched the crash trucks, we're measuring it in the 20,000 parts per trillion uh, level. When we go downstream from our pump and treats, we're seeing it in the 20 parts per trillion level. So we have a reasonable level of confidence that um, a, a major portion of what's, what's out there is being captured by our system. Just because I'm an engineer, I love numbers, I had to throw a couple out. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Next. Um, this is going to talk more in detail. You've heard already about this already, about the survey, but um, MDQ sample, but so did the Air Force at the same time. We took samples out of the same wells at the same time. They took half of it, and the Air Force took half of it, and sent them to different labs, and, and we both got results. Um, uh, we sampled Whispering Woods, which was the first place we went to, since that was uh, what they termed, I think, a type one municipal well, served more than just one re resident. So we went out there, sampled that first, and um, we got the results on that first before we undertook the private well sampling in the December time frame. Uh, we were unable to find everybody home or even that was able to, that were not home and were, say, at work. Uh, we weren't able to catch everybody that had a well in those areas and we're going to follow up and go out there and catch the rest of them uh, this spring. Same map, only I did a little bit of coloring of where the area was, where we measured, which was basically up from that dry creek, kind of on the north. That was kind of the northern boundary. Uh, but the reality is the very first private well that we encountered, I think, was somewhere down in this area here. And we, this was the area of concern where we looked to see, are there any wells there? We uh, went to the residents to see if they had wells. They either uh, returned a, a, a sample form that said they had them or, or they didn't have them. So that's how we were able to determine that. We couldn't uh, force our way in to see if they had a well. So uh, as far as we know, everybody was honest and responded to us when they, when they had a well. But anyways, that was the area that we sampled. Next. Now here is uh, what's been talked about a lot, this EPA health provisory, uh, provisional health pro advisory number, uh, the 200 for PFOS and 400 for uh, PFOA, and that's in parts per trillion. Um, all the sample results in the private wells that the Air Force sampled and the MDEQ sampled for that matter were all well below the PHA number. These are the specific results for Whispering Woods, six parts per trillion of PFOA or PFOS and 9.6 parts per trillion, I'm sorry, six, there were two wells. Six and 9.6 of PFOS were found in the two separate wells they had there. No PFOA found or it was non-detect at the detection level. And those are numbers are compared to your 200 uh, basically 6 and 9.6 compared to the 200. Then when you go to the residential wells that we sampled, we found eight wells that actually had PFOS and or PFOA in them. Um, the maximum concentrations of PFOS were 
in a, uh, we had a range of 10.6 to 27.8 of the eight that we had found it in. Uh, and for PFOA, the concentrations ranged from 17.7 to 51. And those numbers, again, are compared, the PFOA is compared to the 200, the PFOA compared to the uh, 400. Next. Um, Excuse me, Paul? Yes. I have a question relating to these numbers. Yes. So EPA is stating for a problem to occur, you need to be above 200 parts per trillion. Of PFOS. PFOS. Yes. The wells and everything else you're speaking of is six parts per trillion, up to 20 parts per trillion. Yes, sir. Okay, and then we have the state saying that the water, we advise that the water not be drinking. What is the level difference between what they're seeing, what you're seeing, and what EPA sees? How is everybody going to come together so the community can either drink the water, not drink the water, or figure out how to react? I, th I think uh, Chris covered that fairly well earlier by saying why they recommended, even though they were below, uh, the numbers were all below the advisory. There's nothing specific with what Chris said as it relates to the numbers that you're showing on board. She said there are uh, hazards that could occur with the ingestion of the PFAS or the PFOA. And we all have an understanding that there is a health risk involved with that. But you can't react to anything because you're not above 200 PPT. The state is telling us that the water is really not drinkable, but how are we going to get to a middle point when numbers are so low, but the EPA's numbers are so high? And I think that's the dilemma that Dr. Termath was talking about earlier. We, we, uh, we have a legal authorization uh, to address the contaminants at EPA's published number. Yeah. Uh, we're not in the health business, and, and your health folks have given you a different set of advice. Yeah, yeah. so the legislators that are here we have to maybe mediate between the two parties to determine <coughs> what is the level we need to be really conscious of. I mean, how do we determine where do we stand? Is the water good? Is it not good? Is, I mean, what's, how do we determine what it is? We're going off to completely different standards of information. How do, how do we change, how do we do that? How, is it, how do we determine what is accurate for us as a community? And then to add to that, I would like to know if a controlled fire burn is using the same chemicals. Are you talking Outside about in the, the in the woods? Yes, when they do their controlled fire burn. I don't know the answer to that. You'd have to direct that kind of the forest service or DNR. Our groundwater. I I'm, I don't know. In this area, because we're in this area, we're talking PFC, and I'm totally staying with your PFC. Thank you. I'm trying not to go off topic at all. Yeah. No, I, I really don't know the answer to Forest Service or the MDNR, whoever well, your group organizes those. Well, you're together with them because this is all part of your when, group. Uh, when, when we wrap up and take some questions, I, I think that uh, Dale and the DEQ can talk a little bit about as what we've seen in the forest in particular. They have a series of what we call background wells that are up in the DNR property. Um, and not to steal their thunder, but they've tested them and they're non-detect for, for virtually anything. They're, those are, they're pure as a driven snow. Uh, okay. <laughs> so um, I'm going to let Paul finish up here. We're very close to the end. Yep. And then I think we're going to open it up to the broad uh, for questions for everybody, and I'll, I'll let Sue Next. keep us under control. Okay, now this uh, just outlines the different uh, parts of our team uh, that have been working together uh, for several years. Um, AFCAC, which stands for the Air Force uh, Civil Engineering Center, executes Air Force policy to protect the public from exposures above the health advisory. 
Michigan Department of Environmental Quality maintains their long-standing oversight role. They've been involved in here from uh, the late 80s at Wordsmith, overseeing all the environmental work out here. Uh, Michigan Department of Human he Health and Human Services coordinates closely on public health implications, and the team as a group informs the community of developments and progress, which as uh, Chris pointed out, this is the fourth time we've been here and we've been having pretty good uh, feedback from the people that we're getting the right information to you guys that you're looking for. And we, I guess we have more questions later potentially to answer and hopefully we can answer all your questions next. Uh, these are the contact uh, uh, numbers uh, for us. Dave Strange out in Lorraine, it's me locally. Uh, our public affairs uh, for the AFCAC. Uh, there's an AFCAC website where you can go to and get a lot of information on. There's links there to our administrative record. I don't have that off the top of my head, but there's an administrative record where you could go into and find all the technical documents that exist on, on the environmental program in that administrative record file. And then there's a couple of social media sites there.